Hello everybody and welcome to the 11th video in the TypeScript Game Engine tutorial series. Last time we set, about, set off in making some architectural changes to our engine and that included adding a transform, it included adding a sim object and a scene, and now we actually need to create the, the sort of second half of this which is a zone to hold the scene as well as some description data and whatnot as well as a zone manager and so that's what we're actually going to create in this video as well as the ability to load uh, and switch between different zones okay so what we're gonna go ahead and do is create the zone class namespace TSE class zone and it's gonna need a a few properties so we want a private underscore name type string we want a private underscore description also of type string we want a ID so we want a private underscore ID type number and we want a scene great okay so next thing we have to add of course is a constructor and we want to take in an ID ID just type number name just type string um, and then we want to take in a description also type string so this dot ID equals ID this dot name equals name this dot description equals description and this dot scene equals new scene so we automatically stand up a scene whenever we create a zone uh, let's go ahead and add our accessors now. So let's we'll say public get ID, turn type number, turn this dot ID, public get name, turn type string, turn this dot name, get description. Turn type string, turn this dot description. And I don't know if we're going to need this, but I'm going to add it anyways for right now. Let's add an accessor to the scene. Okay. So we're going to need a couple of other things uh, similar to some of the other things that we added in scene. We're actually going to need a public method called load. Turn type void. Say this dot scene dot load for right now. And we also need a public update time number void. Okay, this dot scene dot update time. Now I know this seems like another layer on top of the scene, but you'll kind of see where I'm going with this here in a minute. Public render shader turn type void this dot scene render shader. Great. Okay, so the zone contains the scene, but it also is going to contain uh, some other things. It could potentially contain some things down the road, um, maybe such as a, a list of players if it were a um, multiplayer game or something like that. But uh, for now, we're just going to take this sort of at face value 
and and have this um, remain a, a simple lightweight class. And so what we're going to need next is we're actually going to need zone states. So what those individual states are going to wind up being is we have uh, uninitialized, which means that a zone instance has been created, but nothing has happened with it. It hasn't been uh, it hasn't been loaded. It hasn't been nothing is nothing has occurred with it yet. It's just simply sitting there. Uh, let me check my spelling here. There we go. Uh, the next thing we're going to have is we're going to have a loading state, which is basically saying this scene is still loading. Um, so you know we don't necessarily want to update or draw it yet uh, because we're still loading. And then we're going to have a third state called updating. And so all, all zones will actually contain this information. And what this is going to allow us to do is eventually tie in a loading screen so that when we're loading up a scene, we're not locking up the UI thread with loading logic. We can just simply continue rendering something to the screen while the scene is loading in the background. And then once the scene loads, we can flip over to the updating state and start drawing the actual scene. So we're not going to need this right off the bat, but it's good practice to put this kind of stuff in place ahead of time so that you don't have to deal with it later. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to copy this over here for reference. And so I need to export an enum, and we're going to call this zone state. And our states are going to be exactly what we have here. So un in this uninitialized loading and updating. Get rid of that. Okay, so in our zone we're going to have a private property and we're going to call this state for right now. And so for any of you that have worked with, with states before, what we're going to wind up creating here is sort of a very, very simplistic state machine. And a state machine, all it does is basically manage a state of something and the transition from one state to another. And one of the simplest forms of state machine is just going to be basically a switch state machine, which is basically going to say, okay, what state are we in and what do we do in that state? So a zone is going to act differently in the loading state than it is going to act if it's in the updating state. And so that's actually what we want to define here. Because right now we're actually calling render and update regardless if we're loaded or not. So what we want to do is in our update loop we want to say if this dot state equals zone state dot updating then we can do that. Uh, and otherwise it's basically just going to skip updating this scene and not do anything else with it. And as you may have guessed, render is going to do the exact same thing. So I'm actually just going to copy this code, paste down here. Oops. And so what we're going to do is at the end of load, uh, we're going to say this dot scene, whoops, this dot state equals zone state dot updating. Right, so once this load is complete, we're going to update. Now, this is going to change because we're going to have asynchronous loading of assets and whatnot. Um, but for right now, once we finish loading, we're just going to switch to the updating state. Okay, but that's not actually the first state in here. So um, our first state is going to be the default of zone state dot uninitialized. So that's actually what we're going to set as our default, which means that is what happens when we create this. So when we load, we're actually going to flip the state to
loading before we actually do the load call. And not right now, but eventually um, we're going to, this is going to be an asynchronous loading that's going to happen so that we don't have to wait for this function to end to actually flip over the updating. But for right now, this is sufficient as is. So that's all that the zone class is really going to do for right now. It's super simple, super lightweight. We're going to be adding a little bit of stuff to it uh, in the future, but uh, for now, this is actually all that we really need. Okay, so if we refer back to our notes here, so this is our zone that's been created. It's got our scene with our game objects uh, or our sim objects. Uh, it's got an ID, a name, description. Great. So the last bit of this puzzle is the zone manager. So the zone manager, um, let's go ahead and put that under world for right now as well. I'm probably going to wind up moving this to a different folder, but for now, I'll just create a new TypeScript file under world called zone manager, namespace TSE. Okay, we want to export class zone manager. Okay, and in this case, we want to hide the constructor because we don't want to instantiate an instance of this anywhere. Everything that we're going to do here is done statically, so uh, we don't actually want an instance of this floating around. So uh, let's also create a private uh, static. We're going to create a hash map of zones. So we're just going to call this underscore zone, and it's going to be a object type with a key of ID number, number, and a value of zone. Right? Oh, this should be zones plural. So it'll allow us to get a quick lookup of a zone by its ID. So the next thing we need to do is we need to store a private static global zone ID and that's going to be a number and it's going to start off at negative one and so what this is going to be is a globally incrementing number that will be used to populate the ID of the zone to keep things unique and so in order to do this, we're going to call a public static method named, let's call it uh, register, no, let's call it create zone, uh, create zone, right. And we're actually just going to take a name for right now. This is actually going to eventually take in a file that we load our zone from, but for right now, let's just take in a name. And this is going to return type void. Let's actually have it return type number. This will make sense in a minute. So what what we're going to do is we're going to create a, a new zone. So zone equals new zone. But before we do that, we need to have an ID. So let's say zone manager dot global zone ID plus plus. So this is the reason that we're actually starting with negative one is because every time create zone is called this gets incremented which actually will start us at zero the first time it's called. So now we can actually just use for our global ID zone manager global zone ID and we can pass through the name and let's actually take description here as well. Type string and pass that through. Okay, and then we can say zone manager dot zones and then we can say index of zone manager dot global zone ID equals zone. And there we go. So now our zone is created, and we have a unique identifier for it. 
and it's registered in our collection and is searchable. So now we just need to return uh, the zone manager dot global zone ID. And that's so whatever is calling this can actually have an immediate reference to the zone ID that was just created. Not sure if we'll need that, but it's better to, to, to have that information than, than not, I think. Okay, so the next thing that we want to do is have the ability to uh, to set a zone by name. So let's go ahead and add a public static. You know, before I get to that, I probably should actually discuss what's going to happen here. So at any given time, there should be one zone that is active at a time. Uh, it doesn't make sense to have more than one loaded because you can't be in more than pla one place in the world at a time. And so we need to have a concept of an active zone. So um, before I forget, actually, in this zones, I need to initialize that to an empty object or that's going to cause us problems down the road. Uh, let's add a new private static and we'll call it active zone. And it's going to be a type zone. And so what we need to do is say public static set active zone. Mm, you know what? Let's let's say change zone. And we're gonna actually do this by name. So we're gonna take the name of a, a zone in. And it's gonna return void. Uh you know what? Let's not do that by name. Let's do that by ID since that's how we're actually indexing this. It'll be faster. So whatever is actually making this call should know what the ID of the zone is that it's going to be transitioning to. We actually need to add some stuff to zone before we continue. So let's go back to zone and let's create a public method called onActivated. type of void and public on deactivated turn type void. These aren't going to do anything for right now but I need the handles there um, for for code that we're going to add later. So when we change zone we want to check to see if there is a currently active zone. So uh, zone manager dot active zone. So if this is not equal to undefined then we want to call deactivate on it on deactivated um, and then what we want to do is check to see if zone manager dot zones id is not equal to undefined then we want to go ahead and set the active zone equal to zone manager zones ID. And then we want to say zone manager active zone unactivated. And so we have these function calls that are automatically made when we're switching zones, uh, which could be a very powerful thing. Um, down the road. I'm not 100% sure for our game if we'll need it, but for other games we most definitely will. So it's easier to just go ahead and add this in there now, even if we don't wind up using it, than having to sort of rework things to, to do it in the future. Alright, so the next thing I want to do is public static another update. Uh, this is going to take in time, type number, turn type void, and what we want to say is if this, whoops, if zone manager that active zone is not equal to undefined, we we'll say zone manager that active zone dot update past time. Right? So now we can actually say 
statically zone manager dot update and it knows to look at the active zone and update it which then updates its scene which updates the graphic the, the all the uh, underlying sim objects and I'm going to go ahead and copy that method rename it to render take in shader and have the same check but then change this to render change this to shader Right. Okay. So let's call zone manager active zone dot load here. So when we switch, we're automatically going to to call the the load method. And we actually probably should unload the zone at this point. Let's go ahead and add a unload method to zone. Turn type void. And for now it doesn't need to do anything, we can handle that later. But I want to say zone manager active zone unload. Perfect. So now the only thing that we should need to do is actually tie this into our engine. So in engine TS, we have our start method. After we load our shaders, I think is a good place to actually start handling this. So let's create a new zone. We'll say zone manager dot create zone, and we're going to call this test zone and whoops and for description a simple test zone and let's save the zone ID okay so we're gonna go ahead and create a zone and then we're gonna say zone manager change zone zone ID. Now obviously we're not going to want to do this down the road. We're going to want the ability to say walk into a, uh, a portal if we were playing a, a game that had portals and be able to change the zone. Um, we'd want something to be able to trigger that in game instead of having to actually do it like this. But for right now for testing purposes uh, this is what we're going to do. And let's see, so in our loop, we're actually going to go ahead and call, we're going to call our zone manager dot update here. And again, I'm going to pass zero. I'm still aware that this is something that needs to be fixed. Uh, I might even fin go ahead and fix that in this video. We'll see how, how, uh, how that goes here in a minute. But for now, let's just pass zero. And then, once we get to this clear, let's go ahead and call zone manager dot render, and we'll call. We'll send this basic shader. Okay, let's go ahead and build this real quick. And run it. Great. So this is exactly what I expected, which was to see nothing happen because we actually haven't uh, we haven't seen any updates to how our sprite is handled, and that's actually what we're going to to talk about next. So what we need to do is get our sprites out of the engine and into the actual zone uh, that's being loaded. So in order to do that, we're going to have to inherit from the zone class with our own custom zone uh, that actually contains that object. And this is not the ideal way of doing it, so it's going to be a very temporary thing until we can actually get uh, this to load from a file. But for right now, I'm actually going to add a new TypeScript file, and we're going to call this test zone. And namespace TSE. 
export class test zone and that's going to extend zone and all we really need to do is override load so let's go ahead and do that so let's say public load turn type void and it's very important that we call super dot load here otherwise the logic that is in the super class the zone that actually kicks off the scene loading won't happen so we need to go ahead and and, uh, and call that there next thing that we want to do is we want to go into the engine and take out this sprite so let's get rid of that let's cut, cut that go into our test zone and just paste it there and we will cut the sprite information from there and put it into the load and then the draw we will cut it from here and in the test zone say draw shader shader void we'll paste it there in the draw method and then say super dot draw whoops not draw render sorry pass in shader and change this basic shader to just shader okay so we're still hard coding this sprite this is still not optimal but at least we've got uh, a way to actually handle this properly we're actually going to need to change up our zone manager a little bit to support our temporary zone so we have our create zone here and since we've got our temporary test zone class what we need to do is temporarily create a new public static create test zone and I'm actually not going to take a name or description for this because this is very temporary and by temporary this method is going to be deleted so don't take this as as production quality uh, code right here within this method because this is very something very hacky that we're doing to get around having to load a file and as soon as we can switch to uh, loading files for zones this is going to go bye bye so what I actually want to do is I'm going to copy some of this code here from create zone uh, except I'm going to change this to test zone and it's going to take in the same parameters description uh, okay so name I'm just going to call this test and simple test zone and I'm actually going to go ahead and it's actually going to be almost an identical copy of this uh, only it's using test zone instead of zone uh, and some hard coded values here so just to make it abundantly clear uh, this is temporary code until file loading is supported So now in our engine, instead of loading things this way, I'm going to say create test zone. And it's going to go ahead and create that zone, which has the sprite in it for us. And again, uh, sprites won't live in zones directly. We're actually going to handle that next, but I just want to build this and make sure that it works before we move on. And it does not 
one is broken. Cannot read property tint of undefined. Oh, okay. Order of operations issue. I was creating the zone before the material was actually registered, so this should actually happen here. Technically, this change zone requirement should be, that change zone call should be done after the load. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and rebuild this. Okay, and we're good. So now the uh, the sprite is being uh, created within the zone. So obviously we have this whole game object structure and we don't want to be storing a sprite this way in our zone. So we're actually going to need another construct to handle the sprite. So when we were talking about sim objects, and let me just delete this other stuff just to get this out of the way. Um, it holds transform, it holds children, holds parents, scene. But there's another thing that, there, there's something that this doesn't do, and this doesn't provide, sim objects don't provide any sort of visual data of any kind. They don't actually have any logic on their own. They're just containers, basically, for these things. And so, what we're actually missing is one more property that, for now, I'm going to call components. And components actually provide a method of displaying something to the screen. The sim object itself should not be responsible for rendering a, a sprite to a screen. We should have a sprite component that gets attached to the sim object that is responsible for doing that instead. So what we need to do is we actually need to create a structure to be able to add and remove components and, and create a sprite component and then uh, from there be able to attach that to a sim object and so that when that gets added to the scene we're actually drawing that uh, as a, a component of a sim object instead of just drawing a sprite dire directly. So we need to actually add component. Um, we need to add a component class, right? So all components should have a name and all components should have a reference to the sim object that they belong to and all components should have the ability to update or render etc. And that's it. And then uh, what we're actually going to wind up with is we're going to subclass a component and we're going to call it a sprite component. And a sprite component is going to contain a sprite. And so that's where that that's actually going to live. So the, the, sprite, contain, the sprite component contains the sprite. The sim object contains the sprite component. And so that's basically how that that tree is going to work or that's that's how that structure is going to work so we need a component and we need a sprite component so um, in core I'm actually going to add new folder and I'm going to call this components and on our components I'm going to create a new TypeScript file and this is going to be called base component. And let me just rename this to a lowercase b. Oops. Okay. Uh, namespace TSE export class base component. And actually, this is going to be an abstract class because we shouldn't ever be creating a base component directly. And so let's create a public name type string for now. And what else did we say we needed? We needed uh, an object, to the a reference to the sim object that it belongs to, and then update and render calls. So uh, we'll go ahead and say, let's make this private. 
uh, protected, rather. Protected sim object. Let's, you know what, let's call that owner. Um, okay. And we'll need public. Do I want to say abstract? No, let's not make it abstract. We'll just say public update time number void and public render shader shader void. Okay, so this is basically all all a base component does. It doesn't really do much of anything on its own. Uh, we'll create a public constructor. Takes in a name, a string. Uh, but that's that's about it. Uh, let's also create a public method called set. Hmm. I guess for right now, let's call this set parent. So set set owner rather. Owner, which is a sim object. This dot owner equals owner. Okay, so we're gonna do a lot with this uh, down the road, but for now, that should pretty much do it. So let's go ahead and create another TypeScript file, and we're gonna call this one sprite component. New space TSE. Class sprite component. And this is going to have a private sprite. And public constructor take a name as a str name string super name okay uh, let's see ah I forgot to this needs to extend base component there we go okay so, in the constructor, let me see, our sprite component is actually going to need to take in a little bit more information. So what we're actually going to need is a material name, because when we say this.sprite equals new sprite, we need to pass in the name and the material name to the constructor of that. So for right now, uh, as soon as we create the sprite, it's actually going to kick off, uh, so, sorry, as soon as we kick, create the sprite component, it's going to create the sprite and kick off the loading process for that, which isn't 100% ideal, but it will have to work for right now. Um, let's see, test zone. So the actual, uh, the base component also needs a load method. And that's because this needs a load. And so we can say this dot sprite dot load. So the actual um, the actual sprite loading, I believe the texture request is done here, but the loading is actually what kicks off all of this code here uh, to set up the buffers and all that. And the only other thing I should need to pull out of here is a render. In fact, I'm just going to copy this code here. And 
And so now in test zone, I'm going to comment out all this code here. And I'm going to comment that out. In fact, I'm not even going to need this anymore. And I'm not going to need that. Okay. So before I can move on with the test zone, there's a couple of modifications I actually have to make to sim object. So sim object right now doesn't have any any reference to components at all. So I'm just going to create a private property called components and it is going to be an array of base components. And from there, we have add child, remove child, get child by name, get object by name. Okay, so right before load, we're going to say add component. And I'm going to take in a parameter called component of type base component. Turn type void. This dot components dot push component. Okay, so before we actually load the children, we need to add another bit of logic in here to load all the components. So we'll say let c of this dot components c dot load. And I can actually copy this same logic into update. So before we load the children, we want to load the components. Or before we update the children, we want to update the components. Pass time. Copy this logic again. And again, before we render children, we want to render the components attached to this. So there we go. So now. Uh, the order of operations is we perform an operation against the components and then the children, which then follow the same order. So again, it recursively just works its way down. So now in test zone, we can create a private, uh, let's call this test object. and a private test sprite uh, sprite component okay and in load we can say this dot test object equals new sim object and we actually don't have a method of creating a unique ID so for right now I'm actually going to hard code zero we need to fix that, but for now, zero will be fine. I'm going to call this uh, test object for its name. And I'm not going to pass it scene because that's already done. And so I need to say this.test object. Whoops. Uh, this dot sprite test sprite equals new sprite component and the sprite component will name it test and the material name was here which is crate all right and now we can say this dot test object dot add component this dot test sprite and couple other properties I want to set. Uh, I want to set this dot test object dot position whoops dot transform rather dot position. So see it's not setting position directly anymore. We set transform dot position. Um, and we'll set x to let's set x to 300. And test object dot transform dot position dot y equals uh, we had it to 100 before let's let's also set that to 300 okay and 
now all we should have to do is say this dot add this dot scene dot add object sorry uh, and we want to say this dot test object right so we add the object to the scene we shouldn't need this stuff anymore so let's see let's just review here so we're creating our test object we're creating a test sprite we're adding the sprite component to the object we're setting the objects transform uh, position and then we're adding the test object to the scene and then we're completing the the load calls on all of that so that should be good there we take one more look at sprite component so we're creating a sprite here we're loading it here we're drawing here I believe that's everything that we should need to do let's go ahead and build this zone used before its declaration okay I guess I have to create a reference there uh, sometimes when you get that re that error uh, when you're when you're extending a class sometimes this will happen it'll say class zone used before its declaration sometimes what you'll need to do is you'll actually need to create this reference comment um, which the quickest way to do that is just drag and drop a file uh, one of the TypeScript files onto this and I'll just add this comment for you there at the top let's rebuild okay it succeeded let's run okay so it partially worked uh, it looks like our transforms aren't working and I think I know why but what this proves is that the object is actually uh, the sprite is no longer being added to the scene manually it's actually added as a component jack so our architecture is working but there's some stuff I forgot to do in the transform and the sim object that needs to be resolved real quickly so remember before how I have this uh, local matrix and world matrix defined here um, I'm not actually doing anything with them and that's the reason that this uh, that the transform isn't actually accomplishing anything what actually needs to happen is some stuff needs to be done uh, during the actual update loop so in the update loop before we actually update our components or update any of our children we need to perform some updates to our matrices so we need to say this dot local local matrix and then we're going to set that equal to this dot transform dot get transformation matrix so we're going to regenerate our transformation matrix and I want to point out that doing this on every update cycle is not going to be fast we're eventually going to want to only do this when the actual transform has changed but for right now we're just going to do it on every update uh, and then we're actually going to need a private method to recalculate our world matrix let me create a private and we're gonna call this update world ah, matrix and it's gonna take a parameter called parent world matrix of type matrix 4x4 and it's gonna return type void and so what this is going to do is it's going to say if parent world matrix uh, is not equal to undefined in other words uh, if we have a parent world matrix to be working with uh, then we need to set this that world matrix equal to matrix 4 by 4 dot multiply so this is where the magic happens for uh, as far as the hierarchy goes the object hierarchy so we want to multiply parent world matrix by this dot local matrix so we're basically taking our parents transform and applying it to our local uh, matrix our local transformation matrix to get the world matrix and so uh, that only happens though if we have a parent if we don't have a parent then we actually don't need to do um, much at all we just need to say this dot world matrix dot copy from aha I don't have a copy from 
Okay, uh, that's kind of important. So I need to create a copy from on the matrix 4x4. So I'm actually going to go ahead and create that after 2 float 32 array. So I, in matrix 4x4, I'm going to create copy from and it's going to take in a matrix 4x4. Uh, it's going to return type void actually. Let me just call this M to make this shorter. And I'm just going to do this the brute force way. So let i equals 0, i is less than 16, plus plus i. So I'm just going to copy all the elements from one to the other. So uh, this dot underscore data i equals m dot underscore data i. So I'm just going to copy over all those values uh, from the other matrix to this matrix. Back in sim object, now I can say dot copy from, and I can say this dot local matrix. So basically, the the idea here is that the if this object has a parent, it takes its parents matrix into into account. Uh, if it does not, then it just uses its local transformation matrix. This actually winds up working recursively because since we're starting at the top of the tree and working down through the children, this step will have already been done against its parent. So its parent is already uh, relative, its parent's uh, world matrix rather, is already uh, relative to that of its parent. So you automatically get that functionality this way. Okay, so back in our update, uh, we have uh, our logic here to set our local matrix, but the next thing that we need to do is we need to we need to do a a call to our update world matrix. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this uh, uh, update world matrix, and I'm going to use a ternary statement here. And this is not something that I do too too often, but this is a case where I think uh, it, it makes the uh, implementation just a little bit shorter. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this dot parent and I'm going to say not double equal undefined. So in other words, uh, if this parent is not equal to undefined, uh, question mark, which basically says if that statement is true, then I'm going to say this dot parent dot world matrix and then I'm going to put in a colon, which is to say otherwise, and I'm going to pass undefined. So the way that this reads is basically saying we're going to call update world matrix, which takes in a matrix. And to that we're going to pass, if the parent is not undefined, we're going to pass the parent's world matrix. Otherwise we're going to pass undefined, which down here determines the logic here. If the parent world matrix is not undefined, we multiply against this local matrix to get it, otherwise we just copy it from the local matrix. Cool, and I believe that's actually all we need to do, so I'm going to go ahead and build and run. And it's still up here, because I forgot one more thing. Sorry about that. So, sprite component, uh, or actually sprite rather, needs some changes of its own. So before I do that though, I need to be able to get uh, the owner of the component. So what I'm going to say is public uh, get owner sim object turn this dot owner okay so in sim object when when I add a component um, I'm actually missing a step too so when I add a component I want to say component dot owner equals this uh, actually I need to call set owner 
this so that the component has a reference to this sim object and then in the sprite component in the sprites draw method the sprite itself is actually going to have to change up so the sprite right now has a position which is wrong because we actually want to use the sim object's position so I'm going to delete position out of here and what this is going to do is actually the draw method of this is actually going to have to change our, our sprite so what it's going to have to take in is a model matrix which is going to be supplied to us by the component so I'm going to add a new parameter here and I'm going to call it model it's going to be matrix 4x4 four four. and that will allow me to take this matrix 4x4 four four translation dot data and just change it to model dot data and you know what actually since matrix 4x4 four four has a to float 32 array I'm gonna actually say model dot to float 32 array let's just simplify that right so now I don't have to do all that conversion I could just take the model apply it to the to the uniform and we're good to go so that's all that needs to be done in the sprite it now will use the model matrix that's passed to it in sprite component you'll note that we have an error here now so what I'm gonna do is actually say uh, this dot owner dot world matrix and that will actually use the world matrix as the model matrix when we draw the sprite which should position the sprite correctly on the screen so let's go ahead and build that and it's not showing up why is it not showing up okay I figured it out so as you can see the position is now offset correctly as we would expect and remember before in transform get transformation matrix where I said we didn't really need the XYZ rotation that wasn't a hundred percent true so uh, I was trying to sort of shorten things by, by kind of skipping over that and as a result I messed something up so what I did was uh, in my troubleshooting I went ahead and just added in the other two and then added in a another method that handles all three so I added in the rotation X and the rotation Y and I really don't want to go into the math here um, but I added those two and then I added a rotation XYZ which creates a rotation for each then multiplies them all together in ZYX order and returns that rotation matrix and once I did that uh, it now works correctly so now we have a a component a sprite component that is part of a sim object that gets loaded up uh, correctly and um, and is now part of a of a hierarchy so one more thing that I want to test is I want to test the object hierarchy so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna put an update overload in here turn type void down here I'm gonna call super.update pass time and what I'm going to do is continuously update the scene um, so that we can see that the object hierarchy is actually working as intended. To do that, what I want to do is first off, I want to set these down to 30 X and Y. And I'm going to create another object. I'm going to call this one parent object and it's going to be a sim object and this dot parent object equals new sim object 
and I'm actually going to change the value of this to 1. The ID of this is going to be 0. Let's just call this parent object as his name as well. And I want to set this dot parent objects uh, transform position dot x equal to 50. And I want to do the same for y. So I want to set that to 50. And then once we have the test object uh, created, instead of adding it to the scene, I want to add parent object. And I want to take this that parent object and add the test object to it. So now we're going to wind up with something that looks kind of like this. So we have the the scene root. To that we have parent object. Added to that we have the test object. And added to that we have the uh, well test. The test component which is uh, this sprite component here. And so what I want to test first off is to make sure that the positions update correctly. Let's build that run it. Okay, so I believe that's correct. So just to verify this, I'm going to set let's set these back to zero. And now it's about 30 pixels away from the edge of the screen. Okay, so that is working correctly. So let me actually set these to something further in the middle of the screen. So I'm going to set this to 300 and 300. And what I'm actually going to do now is I'm going to, on every update frame, I'm going to say this dot parent object dot transform dot rotation dot Z because we want to we want to spin around the axis that's facing into the screen, and I want to add 0 0.01 to that rotation value every time. And what that's going to do is that's actually going to cause the sprite to rotate around the parent. Oh dear. That is definitely not right. That looks like it's rotating along the x-axis, not the z-axis. <laughs> Here's the bug. This is a classic copy paste error. So I was right. It was at it was actually rotating on the x axis because I was creating three x axis rotations here. And yeah. So that's definitely wrong. So in rotation XYZ I had X here. It just should be X then Y then Z. So let me go back to the test zone and I want to set the parent object. In fact, you know what? Instead of rotating the parent object, let's let's test something else first. Let's rotate the test object first. So it basically should spin in place. Or not. Okay, so <laughs> I had another issue here. Uh, this was 5 and 6. This should have been 4 and 5. So, sorry about that. Uh, like I said, when it's when you're working this low level with uh, matrices sometimes getting the indexes off can really mess things up. So, okay, so for our first test here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and rotate this test object uh, transformation. So let's rotate the test object, and we're rotating around the upper left corner, which is actually what we would expect. So now, if I shift this to rotate the parent object instead, what we'll actually see is it rotates around a sort of radius, like a th almost like a, uh, a 30, 30 pixel radius. And what that actually is is the, the parent object is right about here, and you could see that this is rotating around that parent object. 
So to illustrate this a little bit better, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to create another sprite and I'm going to say parent sprite. Okay? And I'm actually going to take a copy of test sprite and under parent object I'm going to change that to parent sprite and say this dot parent object dot add component this dot parent sprite okay so now we're going to have two two sprites one that's added to the parent one that's added to our test object and I'm going to offset our test object a little bit more so I'm going to offset this by 120 right and so this should clarify things a bit more as to what's happening so what we now wind up with is this is our parent object which is rotating around its origin which is 0 0 which is the upper left corner so you'll see here if I if I hold my mouse still it relatively it sticks to about that point on the screen roughly and you'll note that the the other object is rotating around it so we can see that 30 by 30 offset here and so this is the advantage that you get with a hierarchy system is that when you rotate the parent the child rotates with it and we could then apply rotation to the child object as well and get an interesting effect there so we can actually just copy this line of code and then say change that to test object and it will actually rotate in place but still relative to the parent and so we get a very interesting amount of uh, effects that we can apply just just by doing this so I realize this video has gotten quite long so I think this is a great place to wrap this video up uh, these I want to go ahead and mention that these tutorial videos uh, do take quite a long time to actually produce so I think until we actually reach the end of this tutorial series I'm going to only be posting two of these a week uh, because three a week uh, takes quite a long time to actually set this up and record it and edit it down so I'm going to switch to two uh, videos a week while we're in this tutorial series and then once we're done with this particular series I, uh, I'll, I'll probably switch back to a different schedule but I'm going to try two videos a week for now and see how that works so what I'm going to do is Mondays and Fridays is what I'm going to roll with right now so let me know what you guys think I would love some feedback on uh, this video and the other videos in the series and of course anything that uh, you'd be willing to provide as far as feedback I'm, I'm always uh, I'm always open to that so thank you guys so much for watching I hope you enjoyed this uh, tutorial series so far and stay tuned for the next episode and I'll see you guys next time.